All right, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see all these smiling faces. So um, I am Laura Knott. For those of you that do not know me, I'm one of the deputy directors here at the department. Um, it has been a long time since we've actually hosted a speaker, so that's really exciting. Um, and just because we've had a lot going on the last few years, right? So um, it's nice to welcome um, Dr. Berkowitz. Um, he requested not a lengthy introduction, so I'm going to keep it um, pretty short, but he is here to talk about artificial intelligence and how it relates to healthcare and public health, which is our realm. So I hope everyone's excited. I see, I know several of you are definitely interested in this topic, so um, I hope we learn a lot today. Um, he is a, um, not a native Missourian, but he did graduate from the University of Missouri Columbia with his MD, and so we're happy to welcome you home, Dr. Berkowitz. You know, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to talk about some pretty exciting things, I think. Uh, Laura mentioned I got my MD here, and I do have a, a confession. Even though it says in my CV and all the rest, uh, I'm an in internist, internal medicine, which I am. I'm board certified in internal medicine. Uh, I guess as part of a confession, uh, I have to tell you all, I originally trained in psychiatry. Right? So I did it here at MIDMO, Mid-Missouri Mental Health. Uh, I don't know if it's called that anymore, but it was at the time. And I actually practiced it for a couple of years. And I don't know whether I got sick of it or, or got cured, but I decided to switch into internal medicine. And much to my chagrin, I found I was practicing more psychiatry and internal medicine than I was in psychiatry. Well, and as Laura knows well, I've been in administration now for a long time. I want to tell you, I'm doing a heck of a lot more psychiatry and administration than I ever did in clinical medicine. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like this to be as informal as we can. I know this is a small group, and uh, I really want to get your feedback and try to answer as many questions for you as I can. This is a huge topic, and I can only partially cover some of it, but at least we can, what I'd really like to do is to be able to generate some thought and some questions in all of you. And to get to one of my punchlines, I hope this excites you more than maybe any technology we've ever seen. And by the same token, I hope it scares you a little bit. We've, we've got to figure this one out, and I believe we will. But both of those will coexist. I really have three goals for today. First is to develop a sort of a practical definition and model. When people say AI, what are they talking about? You know, is it a technology? Is it a thing? Is it a robot? Is it whatever? And so I'd like us all to have sort of a common platform as to what it is. We don't have to agree with that, but at least start with a, a basic platform. Then I'm going to spend some time talking about some key topics in AI, such as GPT and some of those other things that are going on. And then finally, I really want to see a call to action. We are leaders. Your department is very responsible for all sorts of things going on in healthcare in Missouri. We've got to take a leadership role with this MI. We've got to work with it. We've got to partner with it. It's not us versus them, computers versus humans, and all those kind of things. It's an ability to partner with a technology that can truly change the world. And that's where I hope we land on this. This talk is going to be more on the basic side to start with because I really feel there's a need for all of us to kind of raise our, all of our boats a little bit in terms of what do we truly understand, what's going on, et cetera. I'm already doing uh, future versions of this that I'm making much more application oriented, but right now I really want to talk about that. Uh, so this is going to be a very data rich presentation. Please just, uh, if you don't have copies, please feel free to distribute those. Uh, I put in a lot of quotes and references for you so that you can have that at your disposal. And also going to refer to a lot of people smarter than me, a lot more into this field so that you can get some ideas of the very diverse opinions, thoughts, fears, hopes, etc. with this technology. Stephen Hawking years ago said, I believe there's no deep difference between what can be achieved by a biological brain and what can be achieved by a computer. It therefore follows that computers can, in theory, emulate human intelligence and exceed it. Mira Jolly out of AI Research said, I believe AI will surpass human intelligence. It's just a matter of time. And as systems are able to improve themselves with minimal to no human involvement, this kind of automation of intelligence will profoundly change the world. Well, you know, you can't even watch the news 
on any given day without some kind of artificial intelligence topic coming up. And it's everywhere. It was on 60 Minutes last, last week. And this was just a random sample about a month ago. I just searched a whole bunch of the newspapers to see what the headlines were. And there's all kinds of stuff. But one that particularly interested me came out of Pew Research uh, earlier in uh, September. And the question was, are the average, or is the average American more excited about AI or are they more concerned? And the, the survey showed, looking at 11,000 people, that in fact, more Americans were concerned than excited. So they made a big news story about this. And that really struck me because I thought, wait a minute, this is a dumb way to look at stuff. First of all, it's not either or. And it's interesting to me that at least because more people are concerned, what that tells me is we need to educate more people about the good things that this can do. On the other hand, I really hope, and this is really my hope for all of you, the real answer on this is 100% of people should be more concerned, and 100% of people should be more excited. It's how we use this and how we put it together. So that's the theme I want to leave with you. There's some pretty darn depressing stuff I'm going to talk about here. But there's also some really exciting stuff. They both coexist. And our role as leaders is to be able to partner with this technology. Use what's good, not use what's not. Let the humans do what the humans do better, and let the robots do what the robots do better. And I think we're all going to be much more better off for that. So that's really my theme on this. When I look at the outline for the talk, first of all, and this is a busier slide, but I want to talk about that definition. Let's develop a common definition and model, at least talk about it, so that when people say, this is what AI is, we can talk about it, or if a vendor, and by the way, this is going to become a trillion dollar business if it's not already, there's going to be vendors coming at it everywhere telling you how you can spend Boku dollars on their products. And some are going to be great, like anything else, some are not going to be. So how do we tell the difference so that we're spending our very valuable resources wisely? Then I'm going to talk about some key topics in AI, like emergent properties, hallucinations, GPT, deep fakes. Now there's a scary one. Brain-computer interfaces, something that's incredibly cool. And then this concept of singularity. Can AI control the world? Can AI lead to the extinction of humanity? And I'm going to show you, again, not what I'm saying, but what some very, very smart and respected people in the field are saying. And then talk about a call to action. So let me start with that. I used Webster as an initial definition. I don't know why. But what does Webster define artificial intelligence as the capability of a machine to emulate intelligent human behavior? Sounds pretty simple, sounds pretty benign. Well, one of the things I studied at Mizzou too, not only medicine, but engineering, when we as engineers looked at stuff we didn't understand, we did what we used to call a black box analysis, technical term. But what it means is we measure what we put into the box, we measure what comes out of that box, and then we try to figure out what's going on. So let's apply that to AI, because it's really pretty straightforward. First of all, what are the inputs into AI? All the various databases, whether it's the internet, various databases, all kinds of things. What else we do is we provide the computer algorithms. Algorithms, very simply, a set of rules that uh, govern how the thing operates. And then what does AI give? Output, intelligent solutions. So when you first look at this, what can go wrong? We as humans control the inputs. We as humans control the algorithms. Wow, this thing is nothing but good. So we could take that and maybe have an operational definition. AI is a process whereby humans program a computer with a database and algorithms. The computer applies these algorithms to the database and provides a solution that emulates human intelligence. By the way, extremely rapidly, extremely confidently, and extremely efficiently. Wow. This is better than sliced bread. This is good. Well, Houston, we have a problem. It's not that straightforward, as we've discovered. There's things called emergent properties, which basically means computers can kind of change the rules as they look at data. I'll get into this more. There's things like frank hallucinations, 
where the answers that we get, particularly from chat GPTs and stuff, are wrong. By the way, beautifully put, beautifully written, but beautifully wrong. And as we progress, do you remember in 1968, the 2001, how the computer? And if you haven't seen that, it's actually kind of cool. I watched it the other day just because I saw it when it first came out. I was a kid, you know, but then I looked at it. Hal the computer. He goes, I'm sorry, Dave. I can't allow you to do that. And Hal, of course, takes over as a computer. Look at the Terminator. You know, that's a more recent movie. And how AI can go awry. So therefore, we're kind of going, geez, this is good stuff. But there's a chance something can go wrong. And how do we manage it? So, what I am going to propose to you as a realistic definition of AI is almost the same as before, a process whereby humans program a computer with a database and algorithms, the computer applies these algorithms to the database, provides a solution that imitates human intelligence. However, but randomly and not controllable by humans, AI may create new algorithms or even give a false solution, all extremely rapidly, competently, and efficiently. That's where we stand. And there is the tug between the good and the bad. This could be absolutely wonderful, but if it's going to lie every once in a while, if it's going to take over some stuff, this could be absolutely catastrophic. So how the heck do we know what to do? Let's start at least with that as a definition, saying this is a very efficient system. It does some really good things, but stuff can go wrong every once in a while. Now, the model I'm using, this looks a little ugly at first, a little complicated, but really it's not. When you look at what AI is from a conceptual thing, I want you to think of three basic categories. First is the hardware, kind of the processing power. And the word behind that is faster, 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 smaller, quicker, cheaper, all that kind of cycle that we've been seeing. That's the hardware piece. The software piece is the logic. And how the logic is getting increasingly more complicated and sophisticated than it ever was before. And then finally, the connectivity. And there's two kinds of connectivity. One is how the computer can be connected to all others, these neural networks that we talk about and all that kind of thing. So this computer, can, your computer can be connected to your computer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other one is what we call brain-computer interfaces, how we can directly communicate with our own brains to the computer. So we have these three things going on at once, this hardware faster, 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 this software more and more sophisticated, and this integration that can connect our brain to literally any source of information anywhere in the universe. These processes are all going on at once, all getting better, better, and better. Now, I'll just talk about a few a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about this processing thing. This is amazing to me, because as an engineer, I had a backpack and I had all my little computer cards in the back of my backpack and I remember a stack like this big that I had that allowed the computer to add two numbers. Holy cow, it was like 120 Fortran cards. Boy, I'm sounding archaic there, but that's what it was. You know, up there is it shows computer cards for a five megabyte program in 1954. Five megabytes! I mean, our phones are thousands of times more powerful than that. Here we go, a five megabyte computer in 1956 being hoisted onto a truck or whatever. It weighed over 2,000 pounds. You realize our phones are millions of times better than that and it's fit in our pocket. Moore, back in 1965, made an observation that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit can double about every two years. 1965. You know what? It's continued and continued. You know, my dad once said, if I were totally rich, would you rather in a month I gave you a million dollars, or the first day of the month I gave you a penny, second day I doubled it, third day I doubled it, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you know, the initial response is, oh yeah, I'll take the million. But if you just take two and multiply it, double it 30 times, you're into like trillions of dollars. So I was totally wrong on that. But that's what is happening here. Moore's law is continuing. Now, you're going to read that, well, it's not true anymore because we get to the point, you know, you can only put so many transistors on a chip. And that is true, and we've, we've hit that limit. But as I'm going to talk to you in a second, we've got other ways. We have quantum computers. We have light computers. We have ways that we can use subatomic particles to control the data. 
So Moore's Law is alive and well. It's not just how many chips and stuff. You gotta look at all of this together. Double, double, double. And that's all we're gonna see. Pretty amazing. And this shows it to you. This is basically computer power flops or operations per second. In 2023, we hit for the first time a computer in research that can do exaflops, which is a billion, billion, basically 10 to the 18th calculations a second. Early next year, GraphCore is going to introduce a computer that's operating at the 10 exaflop level. So, you know, we're way down here with these kilos, megas, gigas. Keep on going, because tell you what, in a, in a year or two, you're going to hear about not only exa, but you're going to hear about zeta and yada and rana, all these things that we never even heard of before. This thing is just continuing. And this graph shows really what I was saying. The processing power is increasing. The cost is just decreasing. The storage is All of this is actively going on. Now, why is this so important? Well, I'll tell you why. First of all, we now have the quantum computers, which, and in the, for the engineers in the room or the folks that like to get into the grittiness of this, basic computers operate on either ones or zeros. You know, transistors, on or off, one, zero. In quantum stuff, you've got what's called quantum mechanics. As you know, that goofy stuff where particles can exist in more than one place at one time and all this kind of thing. The beauty of this is in classic computing, it's just a one zero. In quantum computing, there are literally infinite varieties that can be used to store data, to use data, and all the rest. We're going to see this. The term to think about now in quantum instead of bits is qubits. But it's very, very interesting. Also, light computers using light instead of electricity. Light is cheaper. Light doesn't generate as much heat. Light is actually faster, you know, speed of light kind of thing. All of these moving together to go quicker, 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 it's not going to end. So that's what we've got to think of as we look at this. Why? Why are we just hearing, it seems, about AI in the last year or so? And I tell you what, my knowledge of AI even a year ago was a fraction of what it is now. And yet, as they say, every day on the news we see it. Why? we have now reached a critical value where the speed is fast enough for things to happen that were absolutely unthinkable even a couple of years ago. All right, ChatGPT, it actually did come out about five years ago. Every year, as I'll talk about in a second, the capabilities double, hundredfold, etc. We could have had ChatGPT five years ago, except to ask it a question to take it 40 years to give you an answer. All right, why now, why today, why this explosion? We've finally reached the level where stuff can happen. Now fast forward, if this double, double, double stuff continues, where do you think we're gonna be in a couple years? We have ChatGPT4, which I'll go into in detail. What do you think ChatGPT6, 7, and 8's looking like? Look at our phones. We're now at iPhone 15 or whatever, remember the twos and the fours? It's just going and going. <clears throat> Let's talk about the software a little bit. And again, I'm getting kind of basic, but there's two types of machine learning that I like to focus on. One is called supervised, the other is unsupervised. And fundamentally what this is, and again, to the, to the real computer folks in the room, if I'm being too simplistic, please let me know, but I just want to get a basic concept out there. With supervised learning, you give it a set of algorithms and a set of data, and it learns on it. So it's supervised insofar as here's the data, here's the algorithm. Then in the real world, what we need to do is go to what's called unsupervised, which means give it access to any of the data, and then let it learn and do things on all that data. That's where we are right now. And I'll give you a concrete example. Let's say we want to institute a diabetes management program. Let's say in your hospital or in your community, it doesn't matter. Supervised learning. What that means is we'll take all of the protocols in our diabetes program. If the sugar's over 200, do this. If uh, you know, A1C is this, do that, all this. Stick all these bazillions of algorithms into the computer and then let it look at every database all over the place and implement it. That's supervised learning. So a quick application of AI, it can take one of our programs and almost instantaneously implement it amongst our entire population. And we're talking billions and billions of calculations a second. It can handle the whole population of Missouri in you know, minutes kind of a thing. 
What a great thing. 100% compliance. Now, what happens with unsupervised learning? What that means is the computer can now start looking at data, looking at you and looking at you and say, you know what? We used to say if the sugar's 200, we do X. Maybe it's better if the sugar's 190, we do X. Or 180, change the rules. That's what unsupervised learning can do. It will say, you know what? This protocol ain't so good. We really need to do X, Y, and Z. Now, is that good or bad? Think about it. On the way, it's good because it's a better program. We've learned from the population. But look what else has happened. We have given up of human control to some degree. The computer is now changing your protocol based upon the outcomes of your group. That, again, super exciting, super scary. That's what we mean by unsupervised learning, and that is exactly where we're going. We used to say, used to say, you know, the computer will never be the same as a human because we can teach the computer deductive reasoning by putting in algorithms. And what deductive means is you go from a general and then figure out a specific, meaning medical. You tell the computer the patient has a flu. The computer then says, well, you have fevers, chills, muscle aches, whatever. That is deductive reasoning. So we give them a diagnosis, and it tells you the symptoms. That is easy to program into a computer. You know, take 5,000 diagnoses and all the symptoms with it, plug it in, you got it. And what we used to say is one of the differences between the humans and the computer is we take it a step further. We do what's called inductive reasoning, which is what healthcare people do all the time. The patient doesn't come in to you saying, I got the flu. They come in, well, I got fevers, chills, headaches, muscle aches, and then we then say you've got the flu. That is a lot harder. It's what makes medical care so hard. And you can't just put in algorithms because you have to be able to go back and forth with this. Well, tell you what, computers can now do that. Computers now, with the speed and the power that we have, can do inductive reasoning. Well, you know, finally we said, well, heck, the difference between us humans and them is we have more complicated, we have things like creativity, emotions, empathy, consciousness, all that kind of thing. Well, i got news for you. When I talk to the clinicians, uh, the difference between pity, empathy, sympathy, et cetera, it's a continuum. And uh, I'll just be very quick here. But pity just means you simply acknowledge that something happened. You know, I'm sorry you had a heart attack. Or, you know, too bad. That's the easy level. Sympathy is more of a feeling. Boy, I understand, you know, what it must be like to have a heart attack, all that kind of stuff. Empathy is the next level that you actually can put yourself in the place of that person. I can imagine what you are going through. That's empathy. And then finally, what we call compassion, empathy plus doing something about it. That's what compassion is. Hey, I'm really sorry what happened to you. I can really feel for you. Here's what we're going to do. That's what makes us human. Well, my question to you all is, can complex emotions be machine learned? Can a computer learn empathy? And I'm going to show you in a few minutes that it can, and it does. And I'll give you just a real easy example. Let's say we took 100 people that we know that are very empathic, and we modeled the computer after their behaviors. Not hard to do. And the computer learns that. Machine learns it. Will the computer respond empathically? And by the way, it will because it's following the rules that we gave them. Does it understand compassion? Is it conscious of compassion? I don't know. But it can act that way. Hold that thought. I'm going to get to that with some real data in a few minutes. So the bottom line is, where is the end point here? What differentiates human from computer? We used to say it was our inductive reasoning. Uh-uh, not anymore. We used to say it's our creativity and all of our compassion. Not anymore. Now there are some tremendous discussions going on about what is consciousness. What actually is it? And it's crazy. I, I read this stuff, and honestly, I don't understand it. It sounds like all kinds of crazy gibberish to me. But we really don't know what consciousness is. Some people believe, I'm the only reality. You guys are not. 
well, you believe you're the reality and we're not, all that kind of thing. Where do we draw the line with computers? So this is getting to some real exciting stuff. Then the final piece of this is the connectivity. And again, what fascinates me the most is not only these neural networks and things that we can do, but stuff like natural language processing, which has revolutionized computers. All that means is the computer knows how to take ones and zeros and create words and voice. So when we just talk to Siri or talk to Alexa or whatever, our words are taken by Alexa and ultimately distilled down to ones and zeros, does its little search engine stuff, comes up with its one and zero answers, and then reconverts it back to talking. What's the big deal there? How many hours did, us, did we all spend trying to do uh, computer programs and cards and all that stuff? We can now talk to that computer. So that's the one area, and the other cool one. Again, I'll talk to you in a few minutes. How do we actually use our brain to directly interface with the computer? So this is some neat stuff. I hope as a definition, we can at least use what I said before, how wonderful this all is, but uncontrollably and randomly stuff happens. And then when we think of an AI model, think of it in terms of its hardware, faster, 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 its software, more complicated algorithms and logic, and then its connectivity both to the individual brain and to the world in general. Thoughts on this? Kind of basic, but it's one way of looking at it. Am I off base? What do you think? Any big doubters in the room? Well, let's move on. Let's talk about some of the real fun things in artificial intelligence. The first one is what's called emergent properties. And if you've not heard this before, and again, I may be basic for some people in the room. I'm really trying to cover all kinds of levels here. But what this fundamentally means, definition, unexpected and unpredictable events or outcomes that arise out of the functioning of a system. Random, well, is it random? Nobody really kind of knows this. When you suddenly wake up at 3 in the morning with some cool idea that you've been wrestling with for the past month or something, is it really random? I mean, you might think so. You wake up and you got it, but is it? Computers kind of do the same thing, and they're called emergent properties. Put another way, bottom line, AI can develop a life of its own. We've seen it. It exists. Is it very common? We debate it. Some people have simply said our algorithms aren't tight enough. Maybe, but then there may be something to this also. And that's what I want to acquaint you with. Bottom line with emergent properties is it exists, no doubt. But it shows that a computer can have a life of its own. Many people have tried to equate AI with nuclear power. And so far as nuclear power can either power your city or destroy your city, right? It's how we use it. Some people then simplistically said, well, AI can either revolutionize what we're doing or destroy what we're doing. Very debatable, very logical. It's one big difference. Atomic bombs don't have the ability to push their own red button. I'm not so sure that AI can't. That is the big if right now. And see, I'm going to oscillate almost schizophrenically between really cool stuff and really scary stuff. But that, that's the stuff that we think about right now. An atom bomb can't turn itself on. But through emergent properties, can a computer do it? Maybe. And that's where we stand in 2023. Very interesting concept. Again, some people think we can just tighten up our algorithms so this won't happen. I'm not so sure that it's that simple. But that's what people are thinking. So you're going to hear about it. Now, again, one of the intents of this talk is to help you all separate what's really science versus the clickbait stuff that we see all the time in the news. So you're going to hear, oh, my God, emergent properties. That means the computer is going to you know, kill all the humans. Well, I guess in theory that's possible. But we've got to understand this process better. Now, it gets more interesting here. Uh, a new topic that just came out a few months ago, model autophagy disorder. And it, now, this is super technical, but I just want to show you. One of the things that some people are noticing, that if we keep using old data to program computers, they almost become like incestuous. It starts magnifying errors within the data, and the computer systems don't work as well. Bottom line, 
Data needs to evolve. We have to constantly feed the computer new data to look at stuff, or it will get stale. It's an interesting topic, but I want you to be aware of it, because it actually shows not only do we need to do machine learning, but we need to understand machine unlearning and keep it current. And this is going to be a big thing to see. But I just wanted to bring this up. A little tacky, but good stuff. All right, if it's on the internet, it must be true. Where did you hear that? On the internet. We all know there's wonderful stuff on the internet. My god, you just Google something out of the blue and you sound like an expert. Uh, in healthcare, you know, any patient has the ability to access all kinds of stuff. It used to scare me. Back as a medical student, when a patient would come in saying, well, I've got this disease, I'd say, well, I'm the doctor, you're not, you know, where did you learn all that? Now, most of the patients that we see, number one, have Googled you yourself. I mean, we've all do it, right? And number two, have looked it up. We know there's a lot of great stuff on the internet. We also know, pardon the language, there's a lot of crap on the internet. And how does, one of my roles as a doc is to help the patient navigate what's real and what's garbage. But will AI do that? Can GPT distinguish between real and garbage? Fast forward, let's say you ask GPT if, uh, Paul McCartney was still alive. Well, I saw him on TV the other day. Paul McCartney is alive. But for the old folks in the room, in the 70s, there was a rumor for a long time that Paul McCartney was dead. What if GPT accessed all that data and then comes back definitively, Paul McCartney is dead? Well, depending where that they looked in the internet, that's what they're going to find. It gets into all interesting stuff. By the way, one of the things I'm, I'm really researching now is, um, for lack of better, uh, algorithm integrity. Some people say, I'm just going to throw this out, that go down to the level of the programmer, the person that actually writes those algorithms. Is there an internal bias in the mind of that programmer that will affect the very fundamental algorithms that the computer uses? There probably is. Uh, one of this right-wing guy uh, the other day on TV was saying, well, you know, all those programmers are all left-wing, they're all anti-Trump, blah, 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 blah. But, but anyway, said, therefore, our computers are going to be prejudiced toward that viewpoint. The internet, if you want to go conservative versus uh, liberal, tends to be more liberal. More of the writers tend, and I'm not, you know, assaulting any side here, but can the internet be liberally biased? Probably is. So does that mean our whole AI infrastructure is, in, is going to be biased? Could be. That's the danger here. So one of the things we then see is hallucinations. Definition of hallucination, also called confabulations or delusions. They are confident AI responses that are nonsensical and not justified by its training or algorithms. Basically, it's lying. Some quotes for you. Uh, Orinetzioni out of AI2. AI can give a very impressive sounding answer that's just plain wrong. As Ethan Mollick says, ChatGPT can be an omniscient, eager to please intern who will sometimes lie to you. <laughs> Sounds like our kids, right? And by the way, the more I'm looking at this computer, the more I'm having visions of how my kids were and stuff like that. It gets very, very interesting. You know, might there be emergent properties with our kids? Might they behave one way at home and then when that with their friends, they behave a different way? theoretically could happen, right? And we know damn well it happens. <laughs> hallucinations. Have I accused my kid of hallucinating once in a while? Yup. You know, have they accused me of hallucinating many times? Uh, it's what it is. So bottom line, AI can randomly make things up. Once again, the pundits say, well, maybe our algorithms aren't tight enough. Maybe this. It might be true, okay? Might be true. I want to put some realism in there. But the fact is, you ask ChatGP to write a 500-word essay on Marco Polo, it'll give it to you in 30 seconds. But it may throw in some occasional lies. How do you know? And if you're making a life and death decision on it, or you hand it in to your teacher and goes, wow, paragraph three is a total lie, and now you get an F, even though you never wrote it in the first place, um, how do we stop that? So this is a for real. So that's a good introduction to our friend GPT. Now, I didn't, I, I tell you what, as of March, I didn't even know what the heck GPT was. That's where I was coming from. 
And I still don't know what it stands for. I have to look at it all the time. But it stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Definition. An AI-powered chat box that simulates a human and can generate a response when asked an open-end question. So it's a computer. But it has the ability to listen to us, again, convert our voice to ones and zeros, search it out, convert it back to voice, et cetera, et cetera. GPT has actually been around for about five years. There was a GPT-1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. Every time it comes out, and it was just about annually, the next version is about 100 to 1,000 times better than the previous. So why didn't we hear about GPT two or three years ago? Again, it was too slow to, you know, it didn't work. Now we've got the power to hear it. GPT-5 has been developed, but it's sitting on the shelf. It has not been distributed yet. It has been told that GPT-5 is 100 to 1,000 times more powerful than GPT-4, which we're presently using. So think that one out. And we know what GPT-4 can do. 100 times better, maybe 1,000 times better, and it's available in a shelf somewhere. It will come out. We'll tell you what, play a game. Let's fast forward. What do you think GPT-6 is going to look like and GPT-7 is going to look like? Let me show you just a few things that we can do with this. And you might have seen these, but <clears throat> some are scary. Some are really interesting, too. Simple one, write an essay. So GPT was asked, describe Rihanna's Super Bowl performance and what made it special. And sure enough, it came out with, you know, Rihanna's Super Bowl, blah, 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 did all this stuff. Right? That's the easy thing. Now here's one. Explain the plot of Cinderella in a sentence where each word has to begin with the next letter of the alphabet from A to Z without skipping any letters. 30 seconds or so later, GPT comes out with, A, beautiful, Cinderella, dwelling eagerly, finally gains happiness, inspiring jealous kin, love magically nurtures opulent prince, quietly rescues, slipper triumphs, uniting very wondrously zenial youth zealously. Now, what if someone asked you to do that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think I could do that. But ChatGPT had no problem. Why? Because of the billions of computations per second, they used every word in the vocabulary, you know, and was able to do it. I suppose if they gave you 10 years to do this, yeah, you can come up with it. But the computer can do it almost instantaneously. Gets better. A little hard to see in this light. But the question was, there was a picture. What can be made with these ingredients? A few seconds later, ChatGPT says, there are many options for what you can make with these ingredients. Some possibilities include pancakes, waffles, crepes, French toast, omelets, quiche, etc., etc. Look what it did here. Now, when you look from the back, all right, I get it. Those are eggs down there. I see that. That's milk up there. I got that. What's that white stuff? Is that sugar? Is it flour? Did they find it in the White House? You know, what is that stuff? <laughs> ChatGPT was able to figure that out and then come up with the recipe. Pretty crazy, isn't it? But that's what it can do. Difference between three and four, four can recognize the graphics. Three couldn't. I wonder what five is going to be able to recognize. It gets crazier. This is a study that blows me away. It came out of JAMA in March of this year. March of this year. And the docs go nuts over this one. But basically what it was was a study. Random patient questions were given to a physician and given to chat GPT, medical questions. The medical responses of the chat and the physician were then rated by a team of licensed healthcare professionals, docs, nurses, others. They rated on two things. Medical quality, in other words, was it true medical advice or was it BS? And two, empathy of the responses. Empathy. Now, I don't quite know how they totally judge that, but that's one of the two. 78% of the time, the chat box responses were preferred over the physician responses for both empathy and clinical. Now, clinical, I can almost sort of buy, okay, fine, it's got reference to every journal ever written or, or whatever. Empathy? Remember I asked you earlier, can a computer be empathic? This answered our question. This study, and you know, I've tried to assassinate this study. It bugs me, okay? I mean, like, why is this out here? But you know what? The methodology is good. I mean, it really is. I cannot dispute this stuff. And I, 
I've asked colleagues of mine to do this, but what has it told me? That chat GPT compared to a physician, and I guess any healthcare professional, will answer a question that more people feel is medically sound and more people feel is empathically sound. That's a game changer. That is a, now, is chat GPT feeling empathy? I don't know, I don't even know where does it, chat GPT exist? You know, how much does the internet weigh? All that kind of crazy stuff, I don't know. But, it sounds empathic. Does your boyfriend really love you or is he just saying it? <laughs> I mean, you get into all this craziness all the time. But this is a for real. Now, taking it a step further yet, also in March, ChatGPT was asked to perform on a bunch of standardized tests. So I come to the University of Missouri and say, you know what, all your students have done your SATs and APs and all that kind of stuff. ChatGPT performed at the 90th percentile on a simulated bar exam. I don't know what state, but it was done. Now, next week I'm speaking, well, actually two weeks from now, for the Missouri Hospital Association to their legal group, their health care, the healthcare lawyers. I can't wait to show them this. <laughs> ChatGPT beat out 90% of the lawyers at the bar exam. Now, maybe that's a low bar, but, but no. That's, uh, you know, I got a whole bunch of lawyer jokes. I can't wait to dump on these guys. But, but anyway, um, it scored at the 90th percentile on the bar, 93rd percentile on SAT reading, 89th percentile on SAT math, 85th in art history. Art history, 89th percentile. Now, by the way, that's GPT-4. When GPT-5 comes out 100 to 1,000 times better, where do you think that one's going to sit? This is our reality today with GPT. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And the answer is absolutely yes. Can this revolutionize how we do medicine? Yes. Let me tell you another thing that lawyers are doing. It is now very common for plaintiff lawyers, well, any lawyer, I guess, but just talking to plaintiff lawyers, to use ChatGPT as their initial expert witness. And face it, it's read every medical article ever written or whatever. It, that scares the heck out of physicians. So the person that's you know, on, on the other side has read every article. Now, they're not dumb. They realize there's emergent properties and hallucination. What the lawyers do, and it's very smart, they use it as a basis. So they'll say, okay, here's ChatGPT. Now they'll hire the expert. You know, what do you think of this? What's real? What's BS? What's all the rest? But your competition in a court of law may be someone that's read every legal and medical article that's ever, ever been written. That's a formidable task. That's the future of this. Now, Robert Thompson, who's quite conservative, you know, he says, danger is rubbish in, rubbish out, rubbish all about. Bots like ChatGPT will regurgitate the claptrap as fact. How does ChatGPT know what is the promotional you know, garbage versus the real stuff? It doesn't. How does ChatGPT know if Paul McCartney is dead or alive if it sees two articles? One says he's dead, one says that he's alive. But do you think we can machine learn a computer how to do that? Kind of think so at some point. That's where we're going at. So this is really some impressive stuff. Now it gets worse. By the way, I'm going to get more and more depressing, then I'll come back up. So, but just, just to let you know, deep fakes. I never heard of that a couple years ago. I heard that people are trying to imitate stuff and these really ugly things, and you can completely tell the difference and all the rest. Deep fake, definition. Again, I painstakingly want to just give you definitions on all this so you have these for your file. Deep fake, an image, a video, an audio recording that has been edited, edited using an AI algorithm to replace the person in the original with someone else in a way that appears authentic. I'll cut to the chase on this. You can't tell them apart anymore. Now, some of the geeks are still able to look at exactly how it was constructed and find a difference, and it becomes a cat and mouse game where you try to figure out, okay, who's doing the fake? How do you discover it? Well, then they figure out to get around that discovery, do a different fake, and all the rest. There is a company, I blotted out the name because it pissed me off, but Advertising, we can create any deep fake with no limitation. Just call us and ask what you want. When you think about it, why do you think the folks of the Screen Actors Guild during their strike, why were they so darn scared? Actors, musicians, any kind of artist. Uh, we could, with AI, let's do a 2023 Beatles reunion. All right, Paul's still around, Ringo's still around, cool. Well, George and John aren't. 
But you know what? 50 years ago, we learned how to digitalize music. I mean, that's what a CD is. It's digitalized music. We can easily create a voice that sounds like John Lennon. We can create his guitar because we have all the digital stuff. We could create a sound that is indistinguishable from the sounds that John Lennon made. Right? Same with George. So why can't we have the two living Beatles and then the two dead Beatles with deep fakes have a reunion? And I would challenge you that that would be indistinguishable from anything else anyone's ever heard. That is a reality. So why are creative people so concerned about this? You can replace a musician, the deep fake. You can replace, I don't know, a poet, anybody that's writing, anybody that's doing anything of that nature, an artist. We can digitalize, I don't know, every Van Gogh painting ever made and then recreate a painting using pixel by pixel, everything that Van Gogh did, and how in the world can you tell it apart? So some of the challenges here are amazing. Who owns it? If I have the ability to recreate you in a way that nobody else can tell the difference, what is you and what is the deep fake? Where is the interface between reality and something that's computer generated? That is what we're facing here. Amazing, amazing stuff. Well, now time for a good one. Brain-computer interfaces. Talk a little bit about this. This is amazing to me. And definition. A brain-computer interface or a brain-machine interface is a direct communication between the brain and external device, such as a computer. Here's an example. A little hard to see here, but a person with a prosthetic limb. And the goal is to reach for that little ball. Well, right now, if I see that little ball and I want to reach for it, you know, I, my brain does certain things and it tells the muscles to do this. Well, why can't we implant an electrode in the brain? It's been done successfully. That now learns, so you kind of teach that person, think about, visualize, think about reaching for that ball. And then it starts machine learning what the brain is doing. And then based on those signals, it's now connected to the prosthetic limb and shows it to reach. That is reality. Now look at the wonderfulness. There are people without arms that can now have a prosthesis that works just by thinking about it. You know, hold this thing up, click it, all those various things. Machine learning what your brain actually does and then doing this. How wonderful for people that have lost a limb, etc. And another example, Synchron has a minimally invasive implant that allows a patient with ALS to send emails and browse the internet simply using thoughts. This is a reality, this is a product, okay? So this is not some, you know, uh, deep fake kind of thing. Well, if we have computers that can do that, and we do, first of all, think of the amazing potentials. Think of what could be done by this. But then, as uh, Boucher says, BCIs are a natural beginning to singularity because they can meld mind and a machine in a way no other technology can. Again, I'm quote heavy because I want you to have these if you want to refer to them down the road, but that's what people are thinking. So let's talk about this singularity. And I'll give you a preface, this is gonna be the low point of the talk, just so that y'all know. But <laughs> what does it mean? What is singularity? It's the moment where AI exceeds human control, and we know they can do it through these emergent properties and the rest and rapidly transforms society. It's enormously difficult to predict where it begins, nearly impossible to know what's beyond this. Growth becomes uncontrollable and irreversible, resulting in unforeseeable changes to human civilization. An explosion in intelligence, resulting in powerful superintelligence that far surpasses human intelligence. He says humanity may reach singularity within just seven years. I think that's a conservative number. With this double, double, double stuff, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to take seven years to do. Because look, you know, you've seen this curve way back in the 60s with those gigantic computers that they're lifting with forklifts. We now, a couple of years ago, reached the, in 2015, reached the point where computers had the uh, brain of a mouse. It doesn't sound like much, but it's pretty impressive. It's conjectured that this year we are now crossing the threshold where the power of the computer has the brain of a human. Well, multiply that by 8 billion, which sounds like a lot, but this double, double, double stuff's not so bad. 
How long does it take until that computer has the mind power of every human on this planet? And doing the math, it's not that many years. If this continues as it is, and like I told you, Moore's Law, they say, well, heck, it's, you, know, you, you can't make uh, computer chips smaller. But when you think that all these components going at the same time is accomplishing the same thing anyway, it's going to happen. So it leads to the obvious question, what do we do? Well, Marcel Scharth says, AI has distinct advantages over humans, such as better speed, memory capacity, fewer constraints, potential for more rationality and self-improvement. AI systems, uh, systems will eventually surpass the human brain. Jeffrey Hinton from Google. All right, you remember that guy? He made his bazillions developing all this stuff. He's recently had what you might call an Oppenheimer moment. Right? For those of you who saw that movie, pretty amazing, right? But this Oppenheimer moment, what the hell did we create? By the way, he made his billions, so now he can pontificate on what did we create. But now that we've discovered it works better than expected, what do we do to mitigate things more than intelligent than us from taking control? The big question is not if AI will achieve human intelligence, but when and how. So it leads to the obvious downer question. Can AI then lead to the extinction of the human race? And this is the low point, OK? This, this is it. But uh, Connor Leahy, another guy, he's with Conjecture now, but one of the big developers, his Oppenheimer moment, billions of dollars later, is absolutely it can. Companies that are working on this technology state explicitly that their goal is to develop godlike intelligence. Think of that word for a second, godlike intelligence. Google it. You're going to see all these companies come up who, in their strategic planning and all the rest of their stuff, they talk about not even human intelligence anymore, godlike intelligence. Stephen Hawking said way back in 2016, I fear that AI may replace humans altogether. If people design computer viruses, someone will design an AI that replicates itself. This will be a new form of life and will outperform humans. That's where we're going on this. And one of the reasons you might have heard a few months ago, a group of scientists, a large group, actually 27,000 or so signed this thing, saying, dudes, we got to pause on this thing until we really understand what are we creating, what are the implications, how do we regulate it? And they ask that all research on greater than GPT-4 be stopped until we can understand this better. Well, I'll tell you what, you think people are going to listen? All right, that gets me into the regulation. Uh, what do we do? And one of the problems with regulation is this is a global issue. Right, it's not a Missouri issue, it's not a United States issue. You know, we can regulate all the hell we want in the United States. You think communist China is going to regulate? Or Iran? Or I mean, I don't want to get political here, but let's say anybody nefarious to whatever we're doing. In fact, they're going to love it if we regulate because they're going to do all the other stuff underneath. That is our fundamental problem with regulation. And I could show you a lot here. In the interest of time, there's a whole bunch of things. But a couple things to consider. First of all, privacy violations. How do we prevent, since these computers have access to everything and everybody, how do we prevent anything? Look at deep fakes. Look at all that kind of stuff. We, we can't stop that process. Who owns AI? If ChatGPT says a lie, who do you sue? What's the entity? Again, I can't wait to talk to the lawyers about this. What is the entity here of artificial intelligence? How do we develop a consensus? Because I tell you what, our best case scenario we've already learned. We established after World War II the United Nations. And the goal was to get representatives from every country in the world to sit down and discuss stuff and do it in a rational way and on and on and on. Again, I don't want to get political, but how effective has the United Nations really been in a lot of stuff? All right, Our best case scenario with regulating AI is that we now recreate the United Nations. And that's the reality of this. Again, the bad guys would love the good guys to regulate everything they can regulate. That is my fear. So there's two things about AI controlling the world. One is, does it do it by itself? Or do bad people take a good AI and use it in a bad way, like pushing the button on the atomic bomb kind of thing? I could talk for hours on this, but that's one of the things we need to discuss with all this regulation. 
So let's get into the positive. We talked about the model. We talked about some of the uh, key topics. You all as leaders, what your department is doing for the state of Missouri to improve health is wonderful things. Can this technology help you do a better job? Absolutely. Can we make the average person in Missouri healthier in every aspect? Totally can. Can this be a disaster? Totally can. What are some approaches to doing it? Well, let me start with an approach not to do. And this is what you hear every day. I'm going to lose my job. AI is going to take my job. You're going to hear it everywhere. Back in 2020, the World Economic Forum did a study, and I think it's legit, by the year 2025, which is just a year and a couple of months away, they figured, good news, that AI would actually create jobs, create 97 million jobs. But AI would also take away 85 million. So all right, all right, good guy. Net, net, you get 12 million jobs. Sounds cool. Unless you're one of those 85 or something like that. That was one of the original. And you can see some of the stuff there. I won't go into details, but I'll instead do this. These are two studies that just came out in the last couple months. So these are very up to date. What jobs are potentially in greater demand? Well, first of all, obviously, anybody working with AI. You know, the systems people, the design people, the, all that stuff. Look at some of the ones that they think there'll be less demand. And these are two separate studies, but a lot of similarities. Accountants, customer service agents, legal assistants, graphic designers, content moderators, proofreaders, traders, transcribers, soldiers. Uh, how about financial analysts? I love talking about that with the guy that manages my IRA. You know, can you be replaced by a computer that looks at every stock instantaneously all the time? How can you be better than that? And it's a formidable question to ask. So we're kind of all caught up in, OK, you guys are the winners. You're a loser. You're a big winner. You, you know, might as well start looking for a new job tomorrow, all that kind of stuff. Not a helpful way to do it. And here's why. I'll give you a concrete example. Back in the 90s, or actually it was early 90s, when banks developed automatic teller machines, ATMs, Gosh, we all use them. How many of you haven't been in a bank in the last year or something? None of us do anymore, right? We all go to the ATMs. It all works. The big fear was as AT comes out, ATMs, all the tellers are going to lose their job. Because who needs a teller? You got an ATM. And by the way, ATMs are, you know, never get sick, never, uh, you know, never worry about overtime, work 24-7, all those kinds of things that us humans just don't do. Well, guess what happened? In the first couple of years, when ATMs were distributed up top, the number of tellers per bank decreased from 21 to 13. Banks realized we obviously don't need as many tellers in our banks if we got ATMs doing all this stuff, right? So yeah, that was the initial effect. That would be like saying, OK, you guys are going to lose your job kind of thing. But two unexpectedly good things happened. First. The banks did get a lot of cost efficiencies because eliminating these FTEs did eliminate a lot of costs. What was one of the number one concerns that bankers had in communities? There weren't enough branches in the community. People were tired of just having to come downtown to go to a bank. They wanted a little bank in every shopping mall and all that kind of stuff. During that time, largely due to efficiencies in staff reduction, banks opened 40% more branches. Well, Branches need tellers. So the number of tellers actually increased then by 40%. It kind of washed. Because now you had more banks. Well, fewer tellers per bank, but so what? You had the same number of tellers. More importantly than that, they realized the importance of job re-engineering. All right, the teller's role was changed. The teller doesn't need to be cash in checks. A machine can do that. They restructured the role of the tellers to include stuff like customer service, transacting loans, things of that nature. The job changed. They partnered with AI, saying, guess what? All that stuff with changing, you know, uh, getting cash, we don't need to do that. The machine does it. But we have value as humans doing this other stuff. There is the challenge for us in healthcare or any business, any business. If we look at this as just simply, OK, you're a loser, you're a winner, sorry about that, all this kind of stuff, we are really not looking at it right. Every position in your organization, we should look 
job description or whatever. But look at the functions. Which ones can be better partnered with a machine? Which ones are better partnered with a human? And let's take our humans and get them doing the things that us humans do better and let the machines do the things. Do you think the average teller likes exchanging a $100 bill for 10 10s? Or that's got to bore the heck out of them, right? Let the machine do it. Do you think the doc likes doing all this routine stuff or uh, all these other things? Let the computer do it. So when I work with hospitals around the country, I strongly advocate you look at your individual positions and doctor, how do we best partner the doctor with AI? Nurse, how do we best partner the nurse with AI? Every department that we're in, that is where this is going to work. And that's what I want to talk about really kind of in the rest of this talk. How do we optimize that human AI interface? And it's very individual. So for each position, how do we do that and do it better? And that is how we're going to make this a better system and how it's going to work. I'm going to give you some examples. This is a, out of a blog from David Shulkin in May. By the way, if you all see a lot of talks, you notice almost all my references are 2023. This thing is changing so fast. I literally, every week when I'm on the airplane, revise this thing. And I gave this talk to Missouri Hospital Association about three months ago, and about 30% of it has been changed. That was three months ago. It's just, it's just amazing how this all goes. But let me now give you some concrete examples of what AI can do and then how we partner. So think of that. What are the capabilities of AI and how do we partner? Medical imaging. There were two studies that were done recently that showed that the AI could read chest x-rays and mammograms better than physicians because they could actually look at the individual pixels and they could see stuff. And by the way, do thousands per second or whatever they do flawlessly. So the initial question is, who the heck needs radiologists anymore? Replace them all with AI. Well, you know, there's two brands of radiology. And this is just one example, but I'll, I'll give this to you. What we call our diagnostic radiologists, and they're the ones that read all the chest x-rays. And they sit behind a screen somewhere or sit on a beach somewhere and look at all the packed screens. And, you know, that's a cool job. I'll sit on the beach and read all these chest x-rays. Those are diagnostic. Then we have what's called interventional radiologists. And those are the ones that get in there with the catheters and do all that neat stuff and you can avoid major surgeries and all those things because it can be done. Well, why don't we have the radiologist partner, I'm being very, you know, general here, but partner with this technology, let them read all the darn chest x-rays. And they spend the time doing the interventional stuff which is saving a lot of lives. That is where the opportunity is in these kinds of things. I'll give you another example, new dr drug discoveries. This is an amazing thing. You know, the pipeline to get a new drug. You wonder, you wonder why they're so damn expensive all the time? On average, it takes about eight years for it to go from you know, conception to out in the public, costing billions of dollars per drug, and most of them don't make it. So to have a new drug be a star, Usually that means investing some huge number, like 50, you know, hundreds of dollars uh, to do this. What AI can do is streamline the process. You might have noticed about two months ago, a new cancer drug made it through all the trials very, very quickly because AYI was able to immediately identify who are the good candidates, what are their results. They were able to speed up that whole process. So this cancer drug, which is saving lives, came out several years earlier than it would have otherwise. There is an example of that. Reduce drug adverse events. OK, most people in medicine, we all learn about drug-drug interactions. And adverse drug effects are really bad, and we don't even know most of them. Now, what we know is that, OK, if you're on drug A, if you're on a beta blocker, don't take drug B, Coumadin, whatever. We all know that. So if we see you're on one of those drugs, we don't give you one of the others. It's an A versus B thing. What we don't know is if you are on drug A and B, and we now give you drug C, what does the combination, we know it's okay with A, we know it's okay with B, but what does the combination of A and B do when you now give it C? All right, start adding drugs. I, as an internist, my average patient was on 10 drugs. How many drug-drug interactions can you have with 10 drugs? And the answer is factorial, 10 factorial. So if you're on 10 drugs, it's 10 times 9 times 8 times 7. I don't know that number, but it's a big number. 
There is not a study in the world that looks at this. Nobody's going to invest in that. And by the way, it involves billions of calculations over millions of patients. No human can do that. AI can. I believe many of our bad effects in hospitals, I can't prove this, but I fundamentally believe it, are due to all kinds of drug interactions that we just don't even know about. When someone's on 10 drugs and we add an 11th, do you think it's independent of what's going on with all those other 10? No way. But there's no way of knowing. AI can look at millions of patients and they can say, yeah, you're on the 10 drugs and we're adding 11. If you look across the United States with 300 plus million people, there's a lot of folks like you on 10 of those drugs. Let's see what it has done. There's no way we can do that study as humans. AI can do it. So these are just some. I can go on and on and on with these, but those are just a few examples. One of the most interesting to me is the whole idea of databases and best practices and management. You know, every hospital has things like blood clot prevention uh, algorithms or um, there's a bunch, sepsis intervention, all those things that hospitals have. Uh, heart failure guidelines. The problem with every one of those guidelines is they're all predicated on you having one disease. Heart failure, let's say. How many patients in the hospital have just one disease? All right, what we really need is not a heart failure guideline or a DVT prophylaxis or something like that. What we really need is when I'm in the hospital, we need Steve guidelines that take into account my medical history, my genomics, the meds I'm on, my neuroses, all these various things, and come up with what I need. Humans can never do that. Way too many calculations. Totally impossible. AI can. I for then, then foresee AI having the ability to go from a heart failure diagnosis to, you know, pick your name, to a Laura, di Laura protocol. So when Laura goes into the hospital, they know everything about you, all the this, this, and that, and come up with the right things for you. That's where we can get with this. So it is tremendously exciting to me where we're at there. Well, as I started this, you saw, could your next doctor be a hologram? Within five to six years, the FDA will approve a primary care application qualified to practice medicine as a PCP. And this is Venoid Coastal Out of Microsystems. I believe it. I believe we're damn close to it already. I think ChatGPT is almost there in version four. So five years, yeah. Is this good news or bad news? That your primary care doc could be ChatGPT version seven or something. Yes. Precisely. So I asked the doctor, speaking with a group of docs here in Missouri, actually, and I'm, I'm doing this tomorrow morning with a group of chief medical officers throughout the state. The overwhelming response from the docs was, just like you said, oh, yay, we don't have enough docs. This would be wonderful. And it's not like, okay, you lose your job to a computer. No. Let's think of partnering. Think about this. What if? ChatGPT took call for the docs every night and could handle, I'm, I'm inventing this, but 90% of the questions. We know they can do that. What if we went to one of our smaller communities that's having a hell of a time recruiting a doctor because they don't want to take call 24-7? I get that. I say, you know what? At 4 o'clock, ChatGPT checks in. And every once in a while, they're going to have a question, so they'll call you. Most physicians were very excited about this. They weren't worried about losing their job. They're worried about how do we partner with this. What if we had ChatGPT do all the preventive stuff, do all the billing, do all the insurance BS that takes up so much of our time? Let, let ChatGPT do all that and let me see patients and practice medicine. I went to see my PCP last week just for routine stuff. She's a great doc. I really like her, but she's on her computer. Well, Steve, uh, have you had any chest pain, any shortness of breath, any... I'm going, like, look at me, ma'am, you know. And, and she was frustrated. She didn't go to medical school, residency, and all that stuff to be a typist. She would love, why can't GPT get to the point where they are taking the history, they are writing the notes, and then the doc just looks at it, yup, check it off. More than half of a physician's time, and by the way, this happened 15 years ago, this is not recent. More than half of our time is spent doing non-patient care stuff. What a waste of time. 
Oh, and by the way, when I'm sitting here typing, how intently am I listening to you? I mean, I want to, I'm a good person and all that, but if I'm going, oops, I hit the wrong letter. You know, all this stuff. I'm not listening to you anywhere near as well as I could. No brainer. That can be done. So when I look at this option, again, if we look at it, okay, we don't need doctors anymore. We don't need radiologists anymore. Rather, how can we partner? How can we take our primary care doc and say, okay, let's do a pie chart of all the stuff you do. So 10% of your time is doing insurance stuff. You know, 20% of your time is doing follow-ups, all these various different things. And say, okay, ChatGPT will do all the insurance stuff. They will instantaneously peruse the record to make sure that everything is there so that your insurance claim will go right in. Oh, and by the way, your insurance company is going to pay you right away because everything's cool. You know, isn't this good stuff? And that's how I really hope we look at this. Uh, I tell hospitals, but I think you should too as an organization as you are, to actually develop a special counsel to look at this because you will be inundated with vendors trying to show you all these fancy bells and whistles and all this. What is the priorities of DHSS right now in terms of using this technology? It'll blow your budget in a month if you want it to. Easy. It'll blow it. How do you know what's best to spend your time, your resources, your money on and to really start looking at this? So I think these are some opportunities that we could do. Um, I've actually come to pretty much the end of this because I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for discussion. But just to review, we started by talking about what's a good definition of AI. And again, it's a beautiful thing where we input the data, we put in the algorithms, what the problem is, every once in a while that computer can make stuff up. We talked about a basic model where there's a hardware piece, faster, 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 quicker, quicker, quicker. We talked about a software piece where the analogs and the data are getting more and more complex and sophisticated, better than ever before. And then the connectivity, not only one computer can talk to another computer, one database can talk to another database, but it can even talk directly to your brain. You can show a prosthesis, train a prosthesis to pick up a glass of beer, let's give it a good example, pick up a glass of beer in someone who's lost their arm. Those are the kind of things that can happen. And all three are happening at once. We're getting advances in hardware, advances in software, advances in connectivity, which is why Moore's Law, double, double, double stuff, is going to continue for a long, long time to come. We talked about some things like the emergent properties. Computers will start having a mind of their own. They're already doing it. We talked about hallucinations, where computers will randomly make stuff up. Talked about GPT and its tremendous possibilities. And then the deep fakes, how scary those things can be. Any one of us could be recreated beyond anyone's ability to tell the difference. And that's technology today. The beauty of these brain-computer interfaces, this whole idea of singularity is can AI take over? It is becoming more intelligent than us. At the rate that it's growing, it will only continue. How do we manage it? Therefore, our call to action. We can't just regulate this stuff because it'll never really happen effectively. I'm sorry, it just won't happen effectively. There'll be too many bad guys trying to do too many things. But what we can do is learn how to partner with this. It's not you win, you lose, your job's gone. It's how do we recreate, re-engineer all of our jobs to adapt this process, embrace this process, and work together. And that's literally where we are in 2023. You know, I look forward to doing this talk, say, next year. I don't have a clue what's going to be in it because at the rate this is all changing, you know. My focus today was really on a lot of basics. My next versions of these talks are really getting into all these applications. and a lot, There's so much I didn't talk about. HR applications of this. Uh, in, in business, revenue cycle, supply chain, uh, on and on and on. Imagine in HR, the ability to instantaneously identify any potentially great candidate by looking at all sorts of things instantaneously. Uh, manage a supply chain by 24-7, instantaneously managing every piece of that supply chain. Those are all realities today. Imagine protocols now being individualized to meet your needs when you come into that hospital and how that's going to change the outcomes of what we're doing. Genomics, I didn't even touch on that. We have totally figured out the human chromosome, right? And it, it takes bazillions of bytes to do it. To learn how to manage that requires computer power we even don't really have yet today. But double, 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 we're going to have it real soon. And it will be able to take your genome, your DNA, and totally analyze it 
in a way that humans could never, ever do. So that's where I see this going. You know, I'm 100% excited. I'm 100% scared. I hope through this talk you're kind of a little bit of both. But you know, I have a fundamental optimism. Winston Churchill once said, and I really believe this, he said, Americans will always do the right thing after they've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> now, I think he actually said that. That could be, he might, might have said it right here, you know. Uh, but I do believe that. I also believe something they taught us in psychiatry years ago when they said people don't change until the pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of changing. And too often we wait too long before we do this. One more analogy, and I'll cut it short. I think a horrible mistake we made with electronic medical records. All right, so we've got our Cerners, we've got our Meditex, we've got our Epics, we've got our All Scripts. None of them talk to each other, right? When they first came out, 30 years ago, whenever, we had the opportunity as a medical field to say, you know what, I'm glad you got all these different products out here, but we insist if they come into our hospital, they have to talk to all the other products. You know, I rent cars probably twice a week at least. All right, I rented one this morning. It was a car I'd never been in before. But you know what, I put the key in, drove it right out of the parking lot because I knew where the steering wheel was, I knew where the gas pedal was, where the brake was, and the turn signal was, even though I've never been in that brand of a car before. By the way, don't ask me to change the time or something, but you know, I drove that car pretty damn well out of, you know, smashed into a tree, but I drove it right off of the garage. Why can't we say, I've done that with our medical records. If Hospital A has Cerner, and Hospital B has Meditech, and Hospital C has Epic, they're all good. I'm not gonna say which one's better than the other. They're all good. Why can't they talk to each other? Docs go crazy with this. If you've been involved with hospitals doing uh, conversions, it's one of the worst things in the world. It's the Woody Allen quote where he says, I'm not afraid of dying, I just don't want to be there when it's happening. Uh, for that hospital ain't going to get nothing done for the next year. They're going to be hassling with this stupid conversion forever and ever. Oh, and by the way, on an average hospital, probably spend 10 to $15 million. And by the way, who do you think loves it? The Cerners, the Epics, now hospitals spending $20 million revenue into their company. We could have solved the vast majority of that 30 years ago. So my final call to action to you guys is don't turn this into another electronic record. We've got to decide some basic guidelines, not regulation, okay, we can't regulate but let's decide some basic guidelines so that we can work well and put this together. So I want to thank you. We've got plenty of time for questions. I really respect your time. Uh, please, uh, you all have my contact information. If anyone has any questions, uh, please call me or, or talk to Laura. Laura knows how to get me. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited, guys. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with me, and uh, I look forward to see what this is going on. I hope. We've generated some thinking, some discussion, and uh, move this ahead. Thank you for what you do.